Um, I was I was watching one of John Fresco's um, speeches, and he said himself that even this particular resource-based system isn't perfect. Um, but it's a lot better than what we have now. One of the things I was thinking about that I, I've been hearing a lot of people um, be concerned about is the appropriation, as far as um, will people be, you know, limited to certain amount of children they have to have. I don't know if they're like currently working on responses to this question, but I just think people might find that to be a problem. You know, that what would happen if they decided to have more children? Uh, well, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think I think the idea with this direction is that we we don't really need to impose uh, any laws or restrictions on people. I think the idea is that in in a society like this, if you have if you don't have to work for a living and you have resources readily available for, available to you and you can go to school, more people are going to be educated, more people are going to be in the know. I think that. Once you have a society like that, it's gonna be it's gonna be common information to know whether look if we if we start overpopulating, we're gonna start creating problems um, for for everyone in this world. So I think it's something that we as a society, people, individual choice, it's gonna be like okay, if I do this, I know what's gonna happen. I know it's gonna create problems, and and then they choose not to. I don't think I don't think I mean my the idea that I that I sort of come up with is just that. No restrictions in that sense. No, so I, that's that's not gonna sort of be a restriction. Yeah. I would agree. I think that uh, I think what you said makes perfect sense, Keith. Uh, in in essence, what we are valuing when you're changing a whole value system, you're changing the way you perceive life as it is today. Your time is spent in. In exploration of, of different of different anything you know different genres different uh, disciplines because you're not restricted by the monetary system now these things are a possibility but it's a possibility that gives us something to reach for because if what happens is that we're limited by a monetary system we have to pay for this we have to pay for that and just to just to not continue too long because we want to have as many questions as possible. I was on a van one time, and this guy gets in the van. He's talking about his son. I think it, I think it was his son who just had a child, and and he said, you know, I, I have eight kids, but I only had I only had one TV. I didn't have anything else to do. Have sex, have kids, and, and so therefore now I, I got many more TVs. So maybe I, and he's got. Me. Just to give you, but what well, the real essence is not about TVs and TVs, it's really education. It's really a greater understanding, it's a transformation of our value system. And this is what this is about. You know, awareness is about transformation. You know, we have a value system, as you've seen in most of the videos that's been portrayed, our value system limits us. It, it sort of cuts us off from real opportunities. And that's the real challenge. And that's where we are. Hi, my name is Nikolai. Um, I've been following uh, the Zeitgeist for a couple of years, and I very much agree with the message that's been uh, shown on YouTube, Zeitgeist days, um, etc. Um, however, I think you know the, the the idea is great. I think it's something attainable, probably in the I would say the distant future, not something that maybe to be achieved in my lifetime. However, what I'm, I'm looking to see is, in the system that we have right now, the way our society works, um, we, we have a democracy. And in democracy, it's the popular party that wins it, that changes the ideas. Uh, you mentioned tools. We have to utilize the tools that we have now. I think that the democracy that we have now is a broken tool. It's literally a tool that I'm never really going to try to pick up and use. Um, this democracy that we have now is is a joke. Like we have the idealized version of what democracy is, and that people who do reading and who are fairly educational know that that's not the way that things go down. So I feel that I feel that using the structure that we have now to try to change things is is not an option. That's that's my personal opinion. No one in power 
in this structure is going to want any of this to happen, right? That's what I think. So I don't think that's an option. Now, as what are we doing as a, you know, you're saying we're bringing awareness, right? I think the idea is that you have to reach critical mass. You have to reach uh, to a point where enough people know about this movement and let's say want to move on with this movement, uh, with this, in this direction. And then, and then, yeah, I think that in the future, once you have enough people, then you can start challenging the, the system, you know? I don't think we can do it right now because we don't have enough people. But once you have enough people, I mean, this is a global, global organization. I mean, all around the world, and we keep on growing and growing. And the idea is that once we get to that point where, we, where we're like, where, where our numbers are really high, then we can start, uh, I think, challenging the system. And Peter Joseph always says this one, um, there's sort of this one way that we can do it. If we all decide to like not pay the income tax one year, I mean, that's huge. And what I'm saying is that once we hit critical mass, I think, yeah, once we hit critical mass, I think we can start challenging the system. Now, I think you're right. I think that awareness is not the only way. I think that we have to find ways to, to, to sort of have direct actions now, but it's not gonna happen through the democracy system. That's, that's, that's my opinion. I think you know quite quite often we start off with a with a perception that we think is real, such as democracy. You have a certain amount of space in the United States where you can speak your mind, and but if you were if you were to look at the people that speak on, on television, they don't express views that are counter to the system by and large. So you really don't have a democracy in the making. You have a society as of yesterday. You have the great powers of the world being France, England, and the United States bombing Libya. And they're going to say they're bombing it for each humanitarian reason, and that's democracy. The democracy that you talk about is the democracy where the same United States bombs, has been bombing Iraq, has been bombing Afghanistan, using Libya last night. Using depleted uranium, an element that just doesn't disappear for millions of years. And this is what's happening. It's called democratic. So you have to tell me what's democracy when countries that can kill people left and right, like it's nobody's business. And then we, because of our insulated world in the United States, we sit here in these rooms where we, we're not getting any bombs. And we say it's, the, it's democracy. There's no democracy there. And what, what is being exploited around the world is one that controls mediums of power, one that controls the mediums of transformation, tells you what to think, and you think what they want you to think. It's as simple as that. And people that are killing people left and right in this world, on what basis? On what basis is this happening? On a monetary basis. Exactly. And it's a fight of resources. It's a fight of control. You know, they have Libya for one reason. If you notice, for those people that are following what's happening in, in what the, this ongoing revolution, ongoing questioning of power, of what I call centralized power, because everyone here has power. We just don't know it, we don't use it, but we all have power. And awareness is about power. Awareness is about transformation. Awareness is about getting what an element that is necessary for transformation, to begin to act. That's what awareness is. If you're unaware, you're paralyzed. If you're unaware, you're stuck, and that's what happens. You begin to act when you have awareness. You begin to take responsibility for your life when you have awareness. And you begin to take risk because you will be threatening and somebody will be after you. That's understandable because you are threatening a status quo, and that's pretty much it. This is where the challenge is. It's about our vision. It's about our views. It's about creating a new paradigm, and we can Last question was, what's the Zeitgeist Movement doing? That's what I heard. And since I've been exposed or involved with this movement, uh, media, uh, movies, I, last I heard from Peter Joseph at the opening of uh, Moving Forward, he said there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry that are open to these ideas. They're just not ready to step up yet because they're still a part of the old system. So I think, uh, I have some good news. I, I mentioned that to Roberto last night. I was at a dance, a ballroom dance, because I'm being trained to be a ballroom dancer, right? <laughs> and uh, that's another life. I'm missing. I'm missing my tango class today. And, uh, and my friend said, <laughs> "Where's the great class? Where are you going to be?" And I said, "I'm going to be at the Zeitgeist Movement event." And he said, "Wow, I've heard of that." 
and he knew all about it. And that's good news. So when you ask, I just wanted to share that. The media, uh, the, the YouTube, the social uh, networking, all of what's happening in the Middle East, they used to be able to uh, shut down TV stations and uh, radio stations that said things that the status quo didn't like. But social media is, is a big impetus behind what's happening in the Middle East. So YouTube, you know, this, everything is out there just for people. Hopefully we can ask people to pay attention to what we're saying. That's it, just an observation. Thank you. One thing I also wanted to add, uh, we're here. You know, that's that's what we're doing. We're here. Just the fact that we're all sitting in this room, we're having this discussion, we're asking these questions, we're looking at all these things. You know, this wasn't occurring 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and the further back in history you see, the people have always struggled to get this to the top. We're in an age now where we can actually interconnect across any language. Any country, you pick a border, and we're going through it with information. So I think we've moved along pretty well. I think we're going in a really good direction. So I just wanted to harp on that that last piece. I'm sorry. Next question, the young lady in the front. Okay, so my question is not just to you, but it's pretty much to everybody. I mean, when you talk to people about like the problems that we're facing in this country and the problems, I don't really need this. Okay, my voice is going. So, I mean, pretty much everybody on some level is aware that we all have problems. And they affect not only the country, but they affect us at home, they affect us, they affect our sleep, they affect our health, everything. And when you think about a solution, and for example, like he just said, um, you know, maybe maybe we shouldn't pay federal in income taxes. We work damn hard for our money, maybe we should try and keep that in our pocket. But then on the other hand, everybody in this room is afraid. We live in a world where the cops can pick you up whenever they want. They can pick you up because of the color of your skin. You're afraid to say what religion you are, where you're from. And yes, this is all true and it's great, but how do you talk to people and motivate them when there's so much blatant fear? There's fear when you walk outside. So what is it that we can say to people to make them want to at least take one step forward towards freedom? Because now freedom seems like a frightening place to be in reality. I, and I want to add to that because she's right. Fear is, it's, you know, I mean, fear, you know, you might get picked up by cops, the government, so many different things that can happen to you. And that's why critical mass is so important. Critical, critical, critical mass. How is, it, how is, how is the quote unquote government going to do anything to you when you're 50 million strong doing one act? They're not going to be able to do anything. What are they going to do? They're going to go each, each house, you're going to jail. It's not going to happen. So that's why it's important to have critical mass for everyone to be aware of these things. For, for, and then the more, the more we become in solidarity, the more power we get, the more we start to take risks, like Han said. We'll start to say, you know, we got to do something. We got to do something. And I just wanted to add to that, you know, because I, I think fear is a big problem. Fear is, is a huge motivating force. And as a matter of fact, if you look at, since September 11th, what have, what have they done? They put over you and they say, it's either security, right, or you're going to have a terrorist. And security, terrorist, you know, put your freedoms away. Uh, what freedoms did you have? You know, just put them away anyway. Security, security, security. So you are, you are motivated by fear. You are pushed around by your fears. And what these, pretty much these particular, uh, the things that we do here, what they try to achieve is to break down the walls, is to have discussions, is to open up possibilities. To attain critical mass, you have to have movements of people that act in concert on many different issues. You, you're not going to achieve critical mass by sitting you achieve critical mass by organizing, by talking to people, by doing what we're doing here, by building awareness, and by acting, by going to colleges. That's what we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there's other um, events like this that you guys are doing, or um, you know, ways that you guys are coming together and organizing. What about the meeting? Uh, who, who said that? Yeah, weekly meeting. Who said that? Oh, no, Nathan. Oh, Nathan. Oh, yeah, dude, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by weekly. Well, we have... And I'm not from around here, really, so... Okay, well, um, we, well, 
you know, a little bit more about the Zeitgeist movement. Um, we have, uh, in the U.S., we have chap. I mean, I don't know how many uh, ch uh, state chapters we have, but it's it's a lot. It's like, I don't know, 80%? Well, well, uh, yeah, this is an example. There's over uh, 100 yeah. chapters in Texas. I mean, any yeah. single person in this room can form their own chapter. I mean, we are representing the New York City chapter. I'm from the Bronx. I am the Bronx chapter. You know, I, my zip code is 10467. I am the 10467 chapter. <laughs> so, you know, um, when it comes to a lot of our activities or events and so on, all over the globe, all over the place, and to be more specific here in New York, uh, you can visit, uh, what's the website, Z New York? Uh, ZNYC. ZNYC. You Google us. We're always posting events. I encourage everyone in this room. I know you all have Facebook. Okay. My grandmother has Facebook. It's, um, so it's uh, zeitgeist-ny.com or put in znewyork.net. Znewyork.net. That gets you there. It sort of yeah, and join the Facebook group because we put out a lot of information constantly. We're always holding events. Just last Sunday, we were down in Union Square Park. Street jogging, handing out DVDs, that's a lot of faces from that day. And, uh, you know, we hold bi weekly meetings on full, on the internet over a, a TeamSpeak server where we collaborate on ideas, sometimes they're just social gatherings. And we try to meet every two weeks in person. You know, but right now, I mean, the only thing we can do is just spread the awareness, spread the education, give out the DVDs, go to the colleges, so on and so forth. Just an example of critical mass would be everyone knows that now credit card companies. I think it's important that people understand that that sitting down on a chair, I mean, if, if, if these issues actually affect you and, and you're thinking about it, right? If you're sitting down on a chair and you're waiting for things to happen, like, like that's, like, you gotta just take that out of you. I mean, that's, that's the thing of the past. It's not about waiting for things to happen and seeing, hmm, are things gonna get bigger? Is that guy's gonna get more profound? It's not about that. It's about making things happen. Making, you stand up yourself and you do it. You stand up, you stand up. People always ask, hey, so how are we gonna get to this utopia, you know, the Zeitgeist movement? Well, you have to get up and you have to start spreading awareness. You have to start letting people know, sitting down and just relaxing and like, and, and thinking that, thinking that life in, in the next 50 or 100 years is gonna stay the same. Like, you know, like, oh, you know, it's, it's gonna stay the same. We're gonna always have resources. No, that's not, that's a thing of the past. We reached the, we reached the point where globally we're using all of our resources. I think we use, what is it, a, a one and a half Earths of, of resources? Well, the top soil, the top soil has been depleted at least by a third of it. And the top soil is just a few centimeters down. That's pretty much what happens. But you have to, it, it, when you're doing GMOs, it, what does it do? It, it, it might produce more on certain levels, but you can produce as well, and you have to sort of be able to move plants and move uh, things that people are going to eat from different parts to keep the earth enriched. <coughs> and really do investigate what happens in Africa, countries where no, it's in, a, in a continent that nobody really talks about, but it's a, it's a, it's a continent that has a resource a uh, haven, and it's a resource grab, and you hear numbers of millions of people that have lost their lives in the Congo. I didn't hear that in the mainstream media, though. <laughs> oh, you're not gonna hear? No, no. But they have met. They they have met. They had their little That's big a lie. meeting. Uh, they don't put it out big time, but Ted Dakar, it's it's very clear. He states it. You know, healthcare and vaccines. Or lower the population down to 10 to 15 percent. That's that's just and, and and what I was going to just finish off saying is that we're we're there is an urgency factor. It's not about. I mean, some of us can sort of decide to like, yeah, you know, I won't do nothing. We'll see what happens. There is an urgency factor. 50, 100 years from now, things are just getting worse. I mean, we're all feeling the sort of the collapse of this economy in this country now. Things are getting worse. 
I, I just don't see that sitting back. If if you're about this these type of issues and changing the world, I just don't see sitting down and not doing anything. I don't see that as an option. Uh, I would add one thing. I, I would add one thing as well. I think. Uh, what's happening in Japan has gone from disaster to catastrophe. It is no longer a, Jap a Japanese problem. It is a world problem. And if you didn't understand it, when they're telling you that radiation is coming to the shores of California, when the plutonium takes out and does this, the Japanese state could practically be non-existent. So what we are seeing is the way we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, so nature is rebelling and does its rebellious, and it doesn't really negotiate when it does its stuff. There is no, you may have a choice. You've already done all that you shouldn't do. The fracking that's going on is bleeding and it's creating huge ecological situations that are forthcoming. So, you know, we have to sort of begin to understand either we become more aware and then we turn the awareness into, from theoretical into a practical application then we will continue to sort of watch as if we're watching a big screen, a movie disaster that is unfolding before our eyes. It is up to us to change things. It is up to us to become active. I have another question here. How are you doing, guys? Um, I think one of the problems, huge problems today is that people address their their problems, their issues as individual problems, not social issues of our time. And, you know, Rather than addressing them as these social issues and moving forward and trying to make you know headway, you know, for example, unemployment. I'm unemployed. Oh, that's my problem. You'll say to me, that's your that's your problem. Deal with it. But nobody's dealing with it. Nobody's addressing it. You know what I'm saying? We're all out here trying to find jobs, and unemployment is rising so incredibly. You know, um, and nobody. Nobody cares unless it's in their face, knocking at their door until s there's blood in the streets, and that's that's not you know that's that's not humanistic principles. You know that's not what we should be doing. When when how are we supposed to advocate? You know, moving forward on this, how do we address these issues? Allow ourselves and our, our fellow people to address these issues as social problems. That, yeah, that's that's a good point, and uh, and when these it's funny because like when these social problems hit home to people, I feel that um, you know the, the the mainstream media what they're gonna do is that they're gonna give you a scapegoat, you know. So if if if, if there's unemployment, if you know there's not enough money around for people, what people are gonna do is they're gonna just start blaming other groups of people, you know. Let's blame the unions, you know. Let's blame the Mexicans. Let's blame this. Let's blame blame that. And what they don't understand is that it's the system, blame the system. The, there's literally not enough money in this country for everyone to make enough money. There's not enough money, there's not. You know, someone, a good po po uh, percentage of the population is always gonna have to live in poverty. I mean, it's the, the system is made that way. And when people start understanding that, they'll stop, you know, they'll stop pointing fingers at other groups who are trying to make money, who are trying to live as well, and they should start pointing the finger at the system. Let's change the system. And, that's on the issue of uh, on the issue of uh, you know neighborhoods, people have to break the barriers of communication. You have to go talk to people. You have to form organizations. In schools, uh, you have to form clubs. You have to form clubs that are just not clubs that are instinct or emotional base. They have to sort of be a little bit more diverse. You have to form clubs and discuss things form unions among schools, begin to organize, because organizing begins to have people communicating with each other that normally wouldn't be. So therefore, in your community, or these communities, generally speaking, especially in the United States, you don't have that phenomenon somewhere else. But in the United States, uh, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is the apartment houses, this person lives here, doesn't know this one. This person lives here, doesn't know that one. So on and so forth. So you're, you're separated from everybody. And, and you fear everybody else. I don't know who just moved in. I don't know. I don't know the way. He's playing some really stupid music in there. I really am afraid of that idiot. Of that. So this is what you have. You have these separations. You have these walls. Now, these walls are not going to break down right away. It takes time. Because you're breaking down things that are, first of all, perceived notions of who the person might, he or she might be. So therefore, you're fighting the wall inside. And then you have to deal with the wall outside. Sometimes 
a lot of people can be really, you know, nasty, really detached, disconnected is what I call them. Disconnected from their reality. If they're disconnected from their reality, they don't really give a damn about your reality. Why should they? So you have to sort of break the walls. Uh, and little by little, you don't smash the wall down, but you chip away, you communicate to people, you have to build organizations. And organizations like ours, the one that, a movement is a beginning of an organization. It's not an organization, but it is in the makings of an organization. It is going towards this, let's put things together. And, you know, for us, especially in New York City, I mean, uh, what this movement wants to do is engage, is to enter into dialogue with people. We don't have the know-how. We're not the ones coming up with all the answers. We have some answers, you have answers. Let's sit down, let's talk, let's get things together, let's move forward. And that's how you have to do it. We have to engage, we have to talk to each other. And then we talk, we act, we move forward when we press issues. And that's how you have to do it. But if you stay in your community and you're getting bombarded and you're taking it, the filth will be up to your neck before you say, Amas, you know, like stop. Let's give me a give me a break. You have to you have to take action. Go talk to people. Knock on doors. Say, what are we gonna do here? What's happening? So, uh, and then that's how, that's what has to happen. Everywhere people can organize, organize, organize. We have two more questions. Um, hi, I just have two things to say. Uh, first of all, I like to disseminate information. So what I do is I get DVDs, I talk to people, and I tell them about the Zeitgeist Movement, about many uh, being made by, uh, nothing by the banks, try to get them to understand our system, because a lot of people do not know anything about our economic system. That's one. Uh, the second one is I, I wish people, WBAI, they are tied for seven days. They used to do it for like nine, day, nine days or months, now it's in seven days. But I think everybody here should go to the WBAI archives this past Monday, they were talking on Pacific Forum at 8 o'clock. Uh, they were talking about HARP, uh, um, High Frequency or Rural Research Project the other world. in Alaska. Other world. And, they were, and they were talking about how um, they were uh, doing a lot of um, uh, zapping around Japan. And they feel like, yeah, they've been doing it for about a month now. And look at the results. So this is something very important. And that's part of one thing. The second part is that in, I think in Chicago, their uh, exchange there is actually betting on weather. So I think they're using HARP to actually make money. So this is something that everybody here should uh, uh, realize, that the Wall Street and all these um, exchanges make money out of using technology to destroy our planet. Well, I don't know if most people, anybody here know HARP? Not too bad, that means that a lot of you are, uh, well, for the others that don't know, HARP is uh, pretty much part of the, I would say part of the army, it happens to be in Alaska, in which, oh, and in Puerto Rico, okay. And what they are doing is, it's, it's supposed to be scientific weather engineering. So weather engineering in which you can stimulate different parts of any environment to change it so that it can affect people. Unfortunately, it's not positively so far. It's been more negatively. So that's the huge problem. So I, wanna, I do have a question, but I also want to follow up the first question about procreation. Um, I have a feeling that we're meant to germinate, we're meant to proliferate, right, multiply. Um, this is our home planet, you know? This is like literally the start. If, we, if the Venus Projects becomes a reality, we're gonna literally just like spread all over the universe and there won't be no space issues, you know? Because space is unbalanced. <laughs> um, there's been civilizations that drill themselves inside mountains. There's been civilization, you know, we, we could think of all the other water, yeah. I am on the show, all flowing, you know? Why not? You know, let's think, let's have ideas and make it happen, right? Um, so, yeah, when it comes to procreation, so what? You know, let's, let's multiply, you know? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a great life, you know? Um, my question is actually, I'm leaping forward. Let's make, you know, like, it's, it's a big, it's, it's gonna be like a, a leap of faith kind of thing, but my 
You know, um, we all are here of some age. So we've been here in the 70s or the 80s, right? And you know, there was the flower power, the, the flower movement, right? And there's, you know, the environmental, um, environmentalists and everything in the 80s, like, hey, the ozone layer and everything, right? And now, this, uh, we're kind of noticing that there's been a systematic uh, acceptance of it, you know, global warming and all this stuff. But in a sense, you're you're putting it inside the system, you know what I mean? Like like something that was a pure movement now is becoming like a bootleg version of it, you know? Where it's meant to make more money, right? Even though it's trying to tell you, yeah, you're correct. You are right all along. So I have a we I have a suspicion and a fear that not much of a fear, but if this this idea of the Venus Project is is being broadcast, you know, is being is the friends are you know people that are potentially um, true believers of this movement, they're gonna they're gonna you know represent and do the, what they gotta do. But there's also enemies looking at this project too, and they're gonna look at this as another. I know, their, their, their eyeballs are turning into dollar signs, you know, when they're looking at this. And they're like, okay, yeah, okay, so a couple of million people are into this movement, all right, how can we bank on this, you know? So my question is like, is there a way that we could be immune to this bullshit, you know? That's, I, I, that's a leap yeah. forward in a sense, you know? There's, uh, I don't know about completely immune, but I mean, I think there are, there are steps to take to limit that type of, uh, that type of transition or transformation. Um, I think, I mean, we do little things. Like for example, we don't, we don't give money directly to anyone or, or any centralized like location, like Peter Joseph, who's, you know, whatever the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement. Um, we don't ever give money directly to anyone in a, in a general sense. Like we, every time we give money is for a specific event, specific, specific. So for this event, we asked everybody, hey, let's put together money to get the space, so we did that. The money is allocated. Blah. We have the. We, you know, we have this event, um, and I thank everyone who put in money for that. You know, this. This. We made this happen. So that's that's awesome. Um, Anybody here that hasn't given money, we certainly <laughs> <laughs> back to the dollar signs. You know? um, but yeah, I mean, I think. I think we all just have to be very aware of what's going on. I think you're right. I think there's going to be infiltrators. People who are going to be in the movement. You know, and, and they're going to like. They're, they're going to be sent from someone, from the powers to be, and we have to be very aware of that. And I think that a lot of us who are in this movement, we're very aware, we're very educated, we do a lot of reading, and I think, that, you know, all we can ask is for us to sort of, you know, see it when it's coming and then, and then nip it on the butt, you know? Yeah. Like, actually, right now, uh, Jacques Fresco, um, they're asking for donations to put money together so they can create a movie uh, about the Venus Project, you know? So it's like... I'm probably going to give them money, right? Is there is there a possibility that they might use this money and then take it for themselves? Yeah, there might be a possibility, but I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to give it with good faith that they're going to make this movie. Um, so, you know, you, you, you sort of have to do what you can and stay very vigilant, is, is all I can say. We have another question. Sure. Why don't you go ahead? Hello. Hi. Um, okay, so we know that the people in power right now do not want an informed public. Wait, which people in power are talking about us? Well, These people in power? Because <laughs> I look in this room and I see the power of elite. These are the power of elite. I look in this room and this is, a, this is the Illuminati. These are the Illuminati folks in here. I'm sorry, hold on. Yeah, that felt good, but go ahead, I know what you're saying. <laughs> sure. okay. uh, so, to be more specific, people in government right now, they would, they don't want uh, people to think for themselves, people who can think critically. And we know historically, they will and can and have done uh, very atrocious things to kind of keep it under wraps. They will misguide us, they will outright kill people. Um, but I guess the question is, is there, what's the contingency plan if they decide to basically fight back? I mean, in Egypt, for example, they decided to shut off internet, I believe, for a while, and they know that, okay, we communicate through Facebook, through, uh, you know, through the internet, can't they just shut that off? I mean, and then what, I mean, are we gonna counter that? Is there anything, are we thinking about, you know, not to be the paranoid one in the room? No, that's not bad. No, no, no. That's plenty fine. I mean, we, we, we already 
I guess, address that we, some of us seem to be fear driven, meaning that we were scared of the boogeyman, we think there's monsters under the bed, we look at shadows and we jump. Um, one thing I will say is that if you ever worked in government, specifically United States government, if you know anyone that works in the United States government, you'll know that they're not as adept as you're describing. Meaning that they're not reading your every email, they're not listening to your every phone call, they don't have the capacity to do that. If they could, we wouldn't be sitting here, we wouldn't be having this conversation. If this was really um, a target, if, if this movement, or this idea that we're presenting was, was, was being watched by such capable people, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The fact is that that boogeyman that we keep talking about, that big powerful government that is going to break down your door and take you away while you sleep, doesn't exist. It's 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 a, a product of Hollywood. You know, you have to be scared that way to really be conditioned to think that that's real. That's what keeps people in line. We they don't need a they don't need a, a policeman on every corner when we have a policeman inside of our heads. So I mean. To respond as a contingency, we just don't give that stuff any audience. It's it's not existing. Don't give it any power. Uh, uh, turn off your TVs. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I don't know. I would. Yeah, that's we wanted to respond to. My response would be completely different. Uh, I think I think for what we're doing today, and I understand where everybody, somebody. Uh, we're talking about leaping forward, we're talking about until you begin, a, you become a threat, you, you don't have a problem. So, so usually, that's usually what happens, but COINTEL program gives us a very good indication in terms of people that have been pursued by the United States government in a very systematic way. So, but for what's important for us today, especially being in the Bronx, especially the people that I'm seeing here, that I've never seen before, I'd like them to sign up. I want us to be engaged. Those are the things that we want to see. We want to see people organizing in the Bronx because everywhere there are people that are being isolated, that are being exclusioned, exclusionary towards the central themes of life, and they're putting them on the side. They have an opportunity to change their lives and get into this movement. We, we raise a lot of issues and we have to sort of build this activism, especially in the Bronx, especially in Brooklyn and other areas where people that are concerned are being hit, and it's being hit here. And you're gonna see, if we check out most of the neighborhoods in the Bronx, you're gonna see that the unemployment is much higher than it is in the city. It's gonna be much higher in certain areas. So those are the things that we have to do, and we have to do it with people like you. And um, I, I, I wanna, you know, I wanna directly, you know, respond to your question. Uh, I, I personally do, I mean, that's the great thing about the Zeitgeist movement, that we're, we're we don't, we're not all like sort of brainwashed with the same sort of like rhetoric. We, you know, we all have different opinions, even within the Zeitgeist movement, you know? So like, so like for example, I, I disagree with Kill Money. I, I do think that there are people in power out there who, 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 who will definitely systematically do something about us if, if we become threatening. And I personally, I do want to create con contingency plans. I do sort of want to start thinking about these things. Um, I don't think, I don't, I don't want to focus too much on it, but um, we don't we, we don't have anything in place now to answer your question. We don't. But I've been thinking about those things. I think we should start having a couple of meetings just about that. Hey, what would we do? What would we do? And then move on with forward thinking positivity. Definitely. So uh, very quickly uh, before I'm just going to add to what Key just said. In organizing. Because you have to have a certain level of organization to be able to adapt to a changing environment. Uh, the subchapters, for example, we could do subgroups. In the subgroups also, you will be able to understand that in a subgroup, you could have multiple disciplinary approaches within that group, and that can, this person can do this, this person can do that. So like you have teams. When you have a team of group of people that enter into a, uh, a disaster area, you have a team that deals with this particular factor, this particular team, that you have to be able to reproduce that kind of, of a team, where we have enough knowledge to apply, this team takes care of sprouts, this team takes care of this, this team deals with this, if you get my gist, and we could break it down into these different groups as we go forward. Go ahead, uh, Jason. So, um, Jason. I want to make a, a comment about uh, government and um, the government represents. I think we have to understand that the government is basically a support system for a powerful entity. You know, it's not, we can't say, oh, blame the government directly. We have to understand what they represent. For example, uh, 
let's say a company like Monsanto. Now, the government obviously is in cahoots with this company because this company supports the support system that is the government. They're a buffer between the powerful and us. Now, we're not here to attack the government. That's not what we're about. We have to stop supporting the entities that control the government. So that's important to understand. So, so when you leave this room, you have to understand you're not powerless when you leave. When you leave this room, you have an option of buying your food from your local farmer or buying it from processed food companies. That's where the power lies. You have a choice between watching ABC News, between watching alternative news. That choice is yours. You have a choice of supporting your local artists or supporting your bougie commercial artists. We all have this choice every single day. So understand that you're not powerless when you leave this room. So um, somebody mentioned the uh, overpopulation. That seems to come up very often. And you know, I, when I discuss it with people, people are like, oh, overpopulation is the reason for whatever they blame. People always find something to blame, right? Overpopulation. When you look at certain communities, you know, like us, we can go to the store and get a condom. That's really easy for us to do. In other communities, that's really not that easy. And it's not accessible at all, actually. Um, so when you think about an idea like what's being done by the, by the uh, Venus Project, about sharing resources. If people think about resources, not just to be tangible like commons, um, but think about it as information. When you, get, you look at these neglected communities, right? Classism has affected them. They're at the bottom, they're starving, they're struggling. Um, and we have over here, this in the US, we have this hyperconsumption. No, no other country consumes more than we do, but yet we want to blame overpopulation. Think about all this hyperconsumption, think about the resources, and I don't mean just tangible ones, once again, think about the information, the lack of education. That wasn't some accident. A lot of the richest countries in resources are also the poorest economically. Is that some accident? Is it genetically they just don't get mathematics? No. This is strategy, this is what the problem is. This is why hoarding resources is kicking everybody in the butt. And it's not just, once again, tangible resources, but psychological educational resources. We need to keep building. We need to, that whole critical mass they talk about, creating awareness, helping the next person, bringing, coming up together. Everybody kind of wants to move in a direction thoughtless, you know, just kind of go and do it. Think, think, share that information with others. It's that, that lack of sharing that is, is why we're here now. We're struggling. <laughs>